tena koto, tena koto, tena koto kato. Ko Rauto toku maunga, ko Teima toku awa, ko Kono toku whenua tipuna, ko Bryony James toku ingoa, na neurara. Uh, tanakoto, tanakoto, tanakoto katoa. Thank you very much, uh, Mel, for the introduction and thank you for the invitation um, to, to chat with you all today. Um, when I was Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research at uh, Te Whare Wananga or Waikato, the University of Waikato, I, I, it's fair to say I learned a lot and I learned a lot from my colleagues in the um, social sciences and the humanities, as Mel introduced, I'm an engineer. Um, and one of the things I learned from my colleagues in the social sciences and the humanities is that as a researcher, um, you always position yourself in the center of your research in order to con contextualize the work that you've done. So none of this um, namby-pamby passive voice writing in the third person thing that I was used to. Um, there was an important part of, of that learning journey that said, Bryony, you have to tell people who you are. So that's what I'm going to take a moment to do. I'm going to um, go massively off brief. This isn't just talking about open access. And I'll just take a take a moment to introduce myself to you. So maybe to um, shore up my bona fides in your, your perspective. Um, the easiest place for me to start is probably somewhere that you all started. I, I'm sure everybody um, listening at some stage in their uh, primary school career was asked to complete that exercise. Um, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I'm, I'm still kind of waiting to get there. But my parents, uh, bless their hearts, um, being the sort of people they are, provided me with all the evidence of what I wanted to be when I grew up um, in the form of the exercise that I completed when I was about seven. And um, what I wanted to be when I grew up was a crazy inventor. And I was going to invent crazy contraptions. And then it says here, I will make a big wheel, a sick bag and an umbrella. And with a seven year old's blissful lack of awareness of punctuation, it is to this day uh, impossible to determine whether those are three individual items or just one big thing. But what was clear was that I was going to be an engineer. And um, that was the route that I took. I left Cornwall um, to go off to university. Now, for those of you who are aware of the southernmost, southwesternmost tip of the UK, Cornwall is the home of the greatest export of all time, the Cornish pasty. And um, I, I took some Cornish pasties and I headed off up country to what we call England. Uh, the Cornish do not consider themselves part of England, by the way, um, where I went to the University of Bath, my undergraduate degree. And I did my undergraduate degree in materials engineering. Fell in love with the subject, absolutely fell in love with materials engineering, didn't want to stop when I got my degree, didn't want to stay in England because, you know, John Major. Um, so decided to apply for every possibility for a PhD, every English speaking country in the world without a great deal of discernment, I must say. So I was extraordinarily lucky that I ended up in, um, in Auckland, in the University of Auckland in New Zealand doing my PhD. Really, I was only motivated by the silly hat, but having got the silly hat and graduated from my PhD, I was faced with those questions that all recent graduates are faced with and a ton of opportunities and deciding what to do next. And one, luckily for me, one of the opportunities that really landed in my lap was the chance to become director of the Research Center for Surface and Material Science and a lecturer in the Department of Chemical and Materials Engineering at the University of Auckland. Probably the best decision of my life. Um, had an absolute wonderful time um, in my 27 years at the University of Auckland. Um, and a large part of that was because I got to teach and got to do research and got to do some service. So um, these three pillars of a typical university academic career, teaching, research and service, I'm going to spend a little moment um, just sharing my journey through them, just to contextualise again how, how academics see themselves and how as such they see research and how as such they see the support they need from our colleagues in research support. So um, when you start off teaching, if you're lucky, your department's kind to you and gives you a little bit of teaching to start with. And it kind of expands to fill all available time. And I can honestly say hand on heart that I, I loved every class I ever taught. I, I enjoyed the opportunity to shape the journey of, of thousands of other people. And it was it's just a huge privilege. No matter how much of a privilege it was, though, your teaching does sometimes need a smidge of chemical reinforcement. Um, many people's research journeys are fairly meandering um, within certain boundaries. Mine was as meandering as any other. My, my PhD, when I did it, was in aluminium smelting. 
um, by the time I, I hit the heady heights of sort of professorship, though, um, my research, still whilst grounded in materials engineering, had moved on to the idea of food structure, food texture, how food feels as you chew it, which involved recruiting a bunch of people to chew things up and spit them out. And as my great auntie Weida told me many, many years ago, Bryony, don't play with your food. Well, it turned out I made a career out of playing with my food. Um, the third pillar of an academic career is one of service. And again, everybody takes a slightly different um, route through the service aspects of their academic career. The traditional weighting of these things is 40-40-20, is 40% 40, 40, 20. 40 teaching, 40% research, 20% service. And most junior academics start off with most of their service, their academic citizenship being within their school or their department, as you progress through your career, your, your boundaries uh, broaden slightly, your horizons stretch out and your service becomes to the wider faculty and, and in some cases as mine to the university and, and to the sector as a whole, but also within your discipline, within your community. And, and really it's this framing that I wanted to, to share, much as this is a very sort of meandering introduction to myself, it's this framing um, because this is, this is where a researcher in a university, at least, um, is coming from. They're balancing all of these things and, and you are supporting them in your roles on the, on the central one, on the research one. In terms of my own service journey, uh, as, as Mel introduced, I was Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research uh, at uh, Waikato University. And as part of that role, that meant I was on the Research Committee of Universities New Zealand. And when Universities New Zealand were kicking off a piece of work on open access, I was delighted to put my hand up to chair that, that steering group because I'm a great believer in open access. And this was around about the time that, that CONSOL, the um, Council of New Zealand University Librarians, or the Mafia, as I like to refer to them, um, were, were progressing some work looking at the extent of open access and the impact of open access for researchers publishing in New Zealand. And th this slide is from one of the reports you'll find on the University's New Zealand website. And this is the 2017 data when open access in New Zealand was sitting somewhat below 50%, which is not terrible, but it could be better, obviously. But the important thing that Comsol found in their analysis was that when researchers made their um, research outputs open access, it came with a citation bump. And as I'll talk about later, your, your academic career has a bunch of sometimes uh, perverse drivers, but you're, you're pretty wedded to how many times people are reading your research. So a citation bump by going open access is a good news story for most um, researchers. So this was the picture in 2017 by, um, this is the 2021 data. So over the course of five years, uh, Consol continued to do this analysis year on year. You can see that the extent of open access had got to around about 50%, still 50% closed. The distribution of the sort of open access, you can see there's a little, little green presence there, green open access being when an author can deposit their work in a university or other repository, uh, usually a, um, some version of their work that is peer reviewed and accepted, but maybe not the published version. Gold open access, you can see predominating here where um, a researcher has paid article processing charges in order to make their um, article free to read. And so this change in distribution that Consol was seeing here um, came with uh, a continued citation advantage. So that's the good news part of the story. Open access in 2022 was providing a 71% citation bump uh, to, to research output. So that's a good thing from academics' perspectives. But the flip side of that story is over the course of those five years, the estimated cumulative article processing charges with a thick end of 15 million US dollars. It's about 25 million New Zealand dollars over five years. For the, for the Kiwis in the audience listening who are in the research support space, you're probably wincing a little bit because that's the equivalent of two full MB research programs disappearing into article processing charges. Um, and at this point, Consol said, let's do something about this. Oi, Universities New Zealand do something about this, and hence we ended up with the Open Access Steering Group. And it really was a genuine pleasure to chair that. I, I can't take credit for it any longer. I stepped down as chair of that steering group um, just a few weeks ago, 
Um, since I'm no longer a Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research, I really felt I had to move on. And now Chad Hewitt, who's the Provost and Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research at Lincoln University, is chairing it. So you'll have a lot of fun with that group. Um, one of the reasons it was such a pleasure to chair that group is I didn't have to do anything at all. I did no work whatsoever. I just got to bask in the reflective glory of the people who were doing the work. And in a lot of cases, that was um, console and librarians. So there were, there were great contributors on that group, but I would like to shout out to three, particularly Kim Tayuri, the um, university librarian at AUT, uh, Sue Roberts, university librarian at Auckland University, and of course, Michelle Blake, the university librarian at Waikato University. It's Konzol who've done the heavy lifting on the open access um, advances that New Zealand have made. And those advances really are best um, illustrated by where Universities New Zealand got to. By 2022, we had a very straightforward open access statement, a pan-university open access statement ratified by all eight universities in New Zealand. And it had some fairly simple but forthright promises, and it still does, and we're getting there. So basically, this is supporting bibliodiversity in terms of open access, supporting all models of open access, being very mindful of um, Indigenous rights in the open access and open research space. But the, the bullet point I'd like to draw your attention to is this one here. Um, we committed, all the universities in New Zealand committed, to achieve 70% of open access by 2025, off a base of 48%. That might seem like a really big jump, and 2025 next year, right? So it's not far away. But I must admit, we did cheat a little bit, because even when we were writing this, if every eligible output that could have gone into a university repository was lodged in a repository, we'd hit 70% today. So we can do it. We, we have the advantage of every university in New Zealand having a, a repository where we can put our research outputs and the public that fund the research can then see the outputs. And 70% seems a reasonable target. So then you have to ask yourself, if we could, we could do it today. Why haven't we? Why hasn't that happened? And that I'll come to in my more meandering um, conversation in just a moment. This was a very lively time and still is a very lively time to be working in the open access space anywhere, but in New Zealand in particular, because our main funder, MB, um, the public good funder of the large research programs and the smart ideas um, bids through the Endeavour pool, they decided to get on board with a funder mandate for open access. So in January 23, MB dropped their open access, their open research policy, which basically is an open access mandate. All research funded by MB from the 1st of January 2023 onwards, um, any outputs coming from that research have to be made open access. Now, it's a very permissive and kind policy. It's written very, very well to bring people along on the journey. So the policy says that, that MB is colorblind to the type of open access, gold, bronze, green, sky blue, pink with dots on. MB doesn't mind, just open access. And also they are um, alert to publishers having an embargo, say, of 12 months. So, so MB is alert to all of that stuff. But what, what we're seeing here is an instruction that if you're getting public money, the public have to be able to read the research that they're funding, which I think is exceptional. This was just following suit on the European funders and Coalition S and Plan S that, that drove a large uptick in open access in, in Europe. And we're hoping to see the same thing happen here. Question is, will it? Will we see that change? Will we see a change in researchers and research behaviour um, suddenly taking, a, taking the extra steps that might be required to make their research open access? And whilst I was sort of noodling about on the interwebs recently, I came across this wonderful quote um, from Sam Moore, who's uh, in Cambridge University Libraries. He said, publishing the whole publishing industry won't radically change until the brutally competitive nature of academia changes too. And that struck me pretty hard because brutally competitive is something we're well aware of in the research sector and in the university sector in particular, but sometimes we don't spell it out. Frankly, being an academic at the moment is a blood sport. 
And so if we are going to change behaviours and allow the public to have faith in the research that we're doing so that they can access it and see it and read it, we have to be alert to changing the university systems as well as um, just putting policies in place. So how do we do that? I'm going to come back to the open access statement, and this is where um, the people on this call and in this um, community day uh, have a huge role to play. You'll notice the last bullet point there. Empower and support researchers across the New Zealand university research community to make all eligible manuscripts open. How are we going to do that? How are we going to get academics to change their behaviour, researchers across the board to change their behaviour quite dramatically? You'll hear about that in the next talk. You'll hear some of the practical steps that have flown, f flowed out of this work. Um, Kweishi and Lisa will be talking to you about the Open Access Toolkit, uh, which is a fantastic practical set of steps that the research support community can help our researchers engage with. So I'm not going to steal their thunder. Instead, what I'm going to spend the rest of, of my, my time talking to you about, and hopefully generating some questions, because I'd, I'd rather answer what you're interested in, um, I'm going to talk about the sort of behaviours that you see in researchers, particularly university-based researchers, of course, um, as to what might be driving the behaviours that we would like to see and what sort of support is needed that sometimes our researchers maybe don't realise is needed. So when I say being an, a, a university academic is a blood sport, it sounds a bit damning. So I do have to I do have to buttress that a little bit. I think it's the best job in the world. I think I have been unbelievably lucky to spend 30 years exploring things that I'm interested in, sharing that knowledge to shape the next generation of engineers, in my case, and, and, and really just contributing to a mission that I believe in. I cannot think of a better job. And yet when I talk to early career academics, particularly early career academics at the moment, I almost feel that I have to apologise. I have to apologise that they've gone into a role that I genuinely believe is the best job in the world, and I know they're not experiencing it that way. At best, they feel that they've got a million balls in the air. At worst, they're feeling crushed by the weight that they're carrying. As what appears to be a, a faceless university leadership, me, I guess, um, is saying, we want you to be excellent teachers. We want you to be excellent researchers. Um, Whilst you're at it, uh, please do some service and keep the university running. Oh, we'd like you to do some outreach. We'd like you to demonstrate impact. We'd like you to demonstrate knowledge mobilization. Please be an entrepreneur as well. Engage in tech transfer and generate IP. Oh, and we're really hurting for money. So if you could recruit a couple of thousand more students and then give them an excellent experience, retain them and make sure they graduate, that would be super. Thank you. And I look at our early career staff who have gone into academic research because of the research part of it it's something that they care about it's a discipline that they're impassioned by and we're asking them to do everything else as well and and you yourselves doubtless will have stumbled headlong into this because i don't doubt at some point in your career as research support professionals um you you will have, have, have stumbled headlong into this this tension where you you know the, the researchers are passionate about their research and yet what they're feeling is the tension with their teaching and they're trying to balance everything and sometimes they can be very dismissive of somebody who is actually just trying to let them do the bit of their job that they love most and it becomes quite not adversarial not as far as that but it, it can be very difficult to sometimes pursue those conversations in a constructive way. And again, especially I reflect on early career researchers. Early career researchers, as I've said, they've, they've pursued their passion into a career where they think and believe that they can change the world by understanding their bit of thing better than anybody else understands it. We've dropped them into large classes. We've said, do you mind teaching a bit? Well, they're not trained to be teachers. So they're grappling. And the teaching is the thing you have to do, right? It's the timetabled thing. It's that you stand up at nine o'clock in the morning and there's 518 year olds looking back at you and you have to deliver. You have no choice. So the research that you love gets squished into weekends and evenings. And in amongst that as well, you're also as an early career researcher trying to figure out 
what your niche is. You are trying to create your research identity that's separate from your PhD supervisor, that's separate from the university that you came from. You're trying to create all of this as well. So what can we do? What can, what can I do in, in, in my seat at the sort of the university leadership side of the table now, which still blows me away, by the way? Um, what can I do? What can, what can we all do to support our researchers practically to, to find their niche, to, to balance all these loads that we're asking them to carry, to help them keep all the balls in the air? Well, certainly one of the thing I, things I can do is I can, I can change the marking rubric. So academics in particular, researchers in other institutions like CRIs to a certain extent as well, but academics in particular are motivated by a whole bunch of things. And one of them is progression through the academic ranks, lecturer, senior lecturer, associate professor, professor. So the promotions process is a set of levers that, that the university, the faceless university pulls in order to drive certain behaviors. And the marking rubric, as far as most academics are concerned at the moment, if you ask them, they would say, oh, I'm going to get promoted on my research. And think about that for a minute. 80% um, of the revenue of universities is in the control of the government. 70% of the revenue of universities, all universities across the country, comes from teaching. It doesn't come from research. 70% of our revenue comes from teaching. And yet we're going to promote people on the basis of their research. The 70% that comes from teaching, we're in a volume-based funding model. It, it may change because we have Sir Peter looking at a university's advisory group, so it may change. But at the moment, we're in a volume-based model. We are talking about getting people in those lecture theatres listening. Why does somebody come to a university? They come there because of the reputation. What drives the reputation of a university? The research. Around the world, if you ask somebody to identify a university, they would very, be very unlikely to say, oh, they give really good lectures. They're more likely to say, oh, that person won a Nobel Prize. So the reputation, which comes from research, drives the student recruitment, which drives the revenue. So it's all connected up together. So what can I do from my seat? Well, I can look at the promotions framework and say, let's reward the behaviours that we want to see. Not just publish, publish, publish not just publish or perish. Let's reward the students getting an excellent experience, but also the academics, the staff, getting an excellent experience. The professional staff and the academic staff having an excellent experience as they come to work. How do we take the publish or perish myth, which is, isn't a myth, by the way, it's also now a card game, this is on Kickstarter if you're interested. Um, how do we take this and how do we turn it around? How do we say to our academics, research is what you love, go ahead and research. Publishing is what you need to do. And, and how do we support you to do it? Now, this is a quote that I heard from a professor at Waikato University when I was there. I won't say who. Um, and he said, oh, I, I, I work for El Sevier, but you guys pay my salary. Now, he didn't actually say El Sevier. He was in the social sciences, so he said Taylor and Francis, but I decided to anonymize him. So I work for El Sevier, but a university pays my salary. And, and we all kind of know what he means by that. As, a, as an academic, I apply for funding. I get some funding. I do some research. I produce an output. I submit that to a journal. As an academic, I'm an editor on a journal, unpaid, and I receive these publications. I then farm those publications out to an academic who is also unpaid, who then reviews them. And we go through several iterations of the peer review process, revise, resubmit, adding enormous value to the outputs as we're doing it, all unpaid. Um, and like democracy being you know, a terrible system, but the best we've got, peer review, terrible system, but the best we've got. We can't break that model, but we can massage it and we can modify it. And the rainbow hues of open access are one of the ways we can do that. So as research support staff, all of this is a small part of what you do. And what you do, I can't say how much I appreciate it. Uh, the, the professional staff of the university are just what lets the place function and lets it be excellent. And having now looked after a research office myself, I, I know how much people care 
And I just want to take the opportunity to say thank you for that. The role that research support, that open access, that funding support, understanding terms of reference, the way that all of that contributes to the success of our academics cannot be overstated. So that last bullet point there, empower and support, empower and support. You, you do that every day and it is very much appreciated. So thank you. And I am now happy to take any questions you like whatsoever. So thank you very much.